right, welcome back to the Grand Solar Minimum channel. Today's Sunday, January 23rd, 2022. Thank you for joining us on this, well, really rare broadcast on Sundays. We are hardly ever on Sundays, but um, with so much going on with Mari and I and the channel and the personal lives and just the busy schedules that we are facing, um, there's too much going on right now to wait another day to kind of talk about some of this stuff. So I wanted to do a Sunday special broadcast. By the way, uh, we are about eight days away from the relaunch of Grand Solar Minimum, where we will be back to content. Um, at least what we're seeing right now is just a, a teaser of what's going to be happening. We'll have more videos. We'll have more live shows. Monday through Friday, I'm thinking about a schedule of about Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday live shows, and then a Saturday call-in show maybe once or twice a month. But those days are coming as we are winding down some important work that we need to finish here at the channel. And once all that is wrapped up in the beginning of February, we will be delivering more of the content. And let me tell you, it has been hard not to get to the computer and talk to you guys because so much is going on right now. But let's start with the space weather. 325.3 kilometers per second is our current solar wind reading. And that's pretty, it's pretty, that's pretty low, uh, just to be honest here. A density of 4.2, which is to be expected when you're seeing low solar winds. Uh, 22 is the sunspot number to date. That's right. We only have two official sunspot regions, AR2933 and AR2934. Both of them combined are a sunspot number of 22. Uh, it kind of reminds you of the size of a sunspot during the minimum cycle. Yeah, we had sunspots occasionally during the minimum, but when we did have them, they were small like this. Now, cosmic radiation has dropped a little bit. 7.9% is the current dosage rate. Uh, we were seeing values closer to 9% just a week ago. So we are starting to see a little bit of that drop in cosmic radiation. Could be signaling slight, slight strengthening in the magnetosphere just because of where we are in the cycle. Again, still well below where we usually are as far as magnetic field strength. And there's so many things I can talk about when it comes to proof of that. It's been happening all over the world. We've seen it uh, in our news headlines. And I tell you, today is going to be a biased show because everything I've pulled from my news articles is from Watchers.News. And folks, it's right in front of your face. KPNC is sitting at 2 with a 24-hour max of 3. And we are expecting solar wind from that coronal hole that should be here sometime on January 25th. That's Tuesday. So be on the lookout for a possibility of more seismic activity. Last time I made this announcement, that's right, we had Tonga and a 6.6 .6 earthquake that was before that. I'm sorry, a 6.2 in that region or near that region. <clears throat> so that coronal hole was much larger. It was directly earth-facing. So if anything, that, that was kind of expected when you have something like that. This one here is a little bit north of where Earth would be sitting when you're thinking about scale to the sun. It's not going to be a blast direct hit, but it will affect our magnetosphere in the coming days. All right, let's go over to thegrandsolarminimum.com. That is our website. And check out some more space weather stats. Here we go, live and direct. Here we are, the KPNC has been slightly up and down, nothing really crazy going on, about a three solar flux activity is down, and so is geomagnetic activity as well. So what do we have in the form of sunspots that will be arriving in the near future? Let's check it out. A couple of coronal holes to deal with. Let's see here. This is the one that we're talking about right now. This one will be probably tomorrow Earth-facing. Now, that will be a direct smack right in the middle there, this right here. So we'll have to see. We're going to get a couple of doses of solar winds within a, a several days apart from each other. And then maybe possibly here, possibly another chance for a new sunspot to form here. But still looking kind of quiet, honestly, uh, for where we are in the cycle after all that activity we had. Things are not as active as they once were. 
Remember, we had an M class flare last week as well. I believe it was like a five point something, five point two, and that's a pretty moderate uh, solar flare. Now that was in this vicinity down here. I think that we were looking at this region when that solar flare happened. But at the time, it was right around this area, and it was not directed at Earth. There is a chance that we could still see a glancing blow from these um, CMEs that have happened in succession. But right now, it's not looking likely. And I wanted to mention real quick, guys, uh, the cover for our program today shows the what we call the Tonga Sunset. And when the sun goes down and I take a look at the fading sky and the twilight turns purple, you might have spotted a Tonga sunset. Now, this is from particulate from the volcano. That's right. <clears throat> now, these uh, we've seen these sunsets before. Uh, remember when Kilauea first went off on the West Coast, folks were seeing them in San Francisco, L.A., San Diego, beautiful pictures. So it'll be interesting to see how far that particulate from this volcano makes it. Uh, apparently, if you are seeing this type of sunset, that you are dealing with particulate from the volcano. And folks, there's a lot to talk about that here tonight too as well. So just bear with me. Or I should say this afternoon, I'm used to doing nightly shows. So bear with me, folks. I'm fighting off a cold too. So, you know, fun stuff on your birthday weekend, right? Taking a look at SDO. Well, Again, just those two coronal holes we got to watch for here over the next few days could lead to some minor seismic activity. These coronal holes are not as big as the one that we saw before the eruption at Tonga. All right, let's get started in here. Rare blizzard traps thousands of vehicles on a major highway in southern Turkey. This was on January 20th, a few days ago. Some 2,800 people were stranded on a major highway connecting Turkey's southern provinces after rare Heavy snowfall and blizzard conditions hit the province of Gaziantep late Tuesday and Wednesday, January 19th and the 20th. Heavy snow and blizzard conditions also affected other parts of the country, closing schools in 52 of Turkey's 82 provinces. In isolating remote towns and villages, some remote areas in the northeast are reporting six and a half feet of snow just in two days, folks. <clears throat> Wow. Six and a half feet of snow. We are definitely in the teeth of winter. I know some of us had a late start. I know it was a mild October and a mild November. December got a little bit colder. But now we're starting to see some ridiculousness here. I wish this was a much clearer picture. Six and a half feet of snow. Obviously, some of these cars are buried up to the tires. That doesn't represent six and a half feet. But in two days' time, not just here, very rare polar stratospheric clouds, type 2, appear over Scandinavia. This is more of the atmospheric um, side of things when you're talking about grand solar minimum. The atmosphere is definitely getting colder, and these are part of the proof that we have to see this. This is not caused from chemtrails or CO2 or anything like that. This is natural, and this is the Earth's way of showing us that her atmosphere is cooling. So, nonetheless, northern regions of Scandinavia were treated to a very rare high-altitude spectacle on January 17th. For about two hours, rare polar stratospheric clouds, type 2, appeared out of nowhere, displaying a staggering iridescent contrasting with the dimmer twilight of the short polar days. It is awesome to see this stuff. Um, unfortunately, it's for the cooling reasons and not any other reason whatsoever. And I can tell you, ever since we started declining in solar activity since 2016, and I really started noticing things then, before I even started this channel. But so many changes in the sky with the iridescent clouds, those were beginning to show up as solar activity started to drop. We almost immediately saw the effects of what low solar activity does to temperature. 
The thing that concerns me is that we are only at the beginning of this grand solar minimum. And things already look like they're well underway and we're not even in the in the meat of this yet. So again, more results of a cooling atmosphere, low solar activity interacting with our planet. Don't say the sun doesn't drive the planet when you see images of the Earth's or drive the climate, I should say. All right, let's move along and go on to heavy snow berries, homes in eastern. This is kind of a, a, a repeat of the story I just went off of, but a little bit more uh, in depth. Heavy snowfall over the Turkey area here in eastern Turkey over the past seven days isolated hundreds of villages and in some areas completely buried single story homes. That's right, folks, buried single story homes. The city of o Osabek. Wait, Ovakik? Ovakik. Let's try that. Ovakik. Sorry, I'm really butchering this. Anyway, the Ovakik Tunsil province received over 3.3 feet of snow accumulated over the past few days, while more than 6.5 feet fell in the countryside. Some of the villages, the single-story houses were buried in snow. In villages of the uh, district where the harsh winter conditions prevail, single-story houses we're completely buried in the snow. Yes, we read that three times now. <clears throat> so I guess they want you to know that some of these houses were buried completely in the snow, folks. So heavy snowfall around Europe. Kind of a break here in the U.S. We haven't seen a, a, a ton of snow lately, but still getting it, right? We're getting it in places we're not used to seeing it. So let's talk about Tonga real quick because the snow and the cold eventually are going to have something to do with Tonga, right? The cooling effect on this volcanic eruption. Now, I can't confirm this. I This was shared on social media, and I grabbed it just because I thought it was interesting. I know that we've seen new confirmed uh, height of this particular uh, volcanic eruption at 98,000 feet. That's what they're willing to come out and say now. Originally, we reported it 63,000 feet. Uh, they then came out and said, no, it was more like 98,000. Well, this person here claims it could have been 55 kilometers. Now, that's, I did the math there, that's 180,000 feet, folks. It says here, the National Center for Earth Observation in UK researchers the exact height of the eruption plume. The spectacular huge ash plume spread into the umbrella cloud that reached the confirmed altitude of 35 kilometers. But some points may have risen to an estimated 55 kilometer altitude. It's significant because we know what happens with these types of reports, right? When we know, when we see volcanic eruptions that go past 55,000, we know that that can affect regional climate, right? Yes. So when you hear that there was a possibility, now this is just one research group saying this, but this was Friday, January 21st. This event was a little bit bigger than I think I realized when it first happened. Uh, that's for sure. The fact that it went from 63,000 now to 98,000. Uh, Watchers has a report here that is a, that is willing to go as high as 127,000, folks. Oh, I wanted to show you guys this real quick, too. Uh, we'll go back to that in a minute. So here is the impacts of what's going to be here in Tonga, unfortunately. That's tsunami wave damage. And then strike two is the ash that has ruined the in, everything that grows in the region. Um, that's bad. Streets and roofs can be cleared. Tsunami waves up to 49 feet in some places, and heavy ash have totally ruined all agriculture, raising fears the country will be facing a food shortage. Now, one of the things that we talked, we have talked about on the Grand Solar Minimum channel many, many times, along with other folks, like Lee Wheelbarger, Adapt 2030, 
is the food crisis that we could face because of these events that happened during Grand Solar Minimum. Now, John Casey predicted between 2017 and 2037, we will see a VEI-7 eruption along with other significant seismic events. This wasn't even the big one. As we have just begun in this grand solar minimum, yet we're already seeing precursors of what's going to happen in the future. We're getting a small dosage of it right now. But when you talk about food food uh, shortages and crop loss, and, and it, there's so many factors during a grand solar minimum, and this is one of them, and that is volcanic eruptions, spreading ash in the local regions, that is, and ruining all vegetation. So now you have crop shortages. Yes, the government's going to bail these folks out. Absolutely. But you're still going to put yourself in a crunch. Food supply. On top of that, right now, we're having trouble getting clean water to these folks. So the local impact of Tonga is devastating. The tsunami waves were, I think, in my opinion, were underreported. 49 feet in some places, washing up houses. So the total destruction of crops, ash everywhere, toxic ash everywhere. And then, not to mention, the crazy pictures that we're seeing, the befores and afters of what this eruption has done to the region. And, you know, if that looks all brown to you, that's because that's just ash. Ash covering everything. This is after the eruption, obviously. So many pictures, and, and pictures like this, before the eruption... Here it is before the eruption, and now here it is on the first, this is the first of, uh, the second of January, and this is the 17th of January. That's what this underwater volcano did. Now, my speculation, we have had lots of space weather. We've had lots of cosmic radiation dosage rates, high levels, in my opinion, we're still between 7.9% and 9% cosmic radiation dosage rates. Those are still considered solar minimum type dosage rates. We should be below 5% right now. In a normal solar cycle, we would be below 5%. So the correlation that people like Mr. Casey were making with volcanic and, er and earthquake activity is very real, folks. And we're witnessing it firsthand. We are truly alive in a rare time. Again, more coverage of Tonga, the absolute disaster. The biggest thing, folks, um, there was more death toll. The United Nations from uh, the Pacific Island. Of smoke and look at the size of this. Into the sky. Activity that soon decreased. Death toll is more from the tsunami waves than it is the volcanic eruption the at this point. Day, the volcano rumbled to life again. In an explosion so powerful, it sent shockwaves around the world. Before and after satellite images show how the volcano's sea level crater had disappeared following the blast. <laughs> With regular communication lines to Tonga cut Disappeared. off, the world's been relying on satellite phones and images to get a sense of the disaster. Tell you what, folks, with an ash plume that big, uh, this has to have an impact. We're going to be watching, you know, I, I saw someone uh, on social media trying to downplay this and said this would just have a regional effect, but I don't think so. Um the possibility of this being 180,000 feet, I don't know, maybe. That's huge. That's a lot of ash plume. That's a lot of particulate. That's a lot of blocking TSI. That can change ocean temperatures. That can change weather patterns. Next thing you know, we're cooling. Very complex system. For anyone to act like they have all the answers when it comes to climate science is just absolute rubbish. I don't have all the answers. Still learning myself, but... A lot of the science is pointing on natural causes. Again, watchers did a great job in covering this. They realize how important this situation is, what we are experiencing right now. Is it possible to see a region across the world 
where we get the year without a summer. The shockwave is incredible as well, folks. And this was underwater. That's that's what really, like, imagine if this thing was above sea level. This thing was underwater and produced an ash plume of 100,000 feet. Like I said, in one article, they are willing to acknowledge um, 121,000 feet. And stunning ash plume, folks. That is the kind that definitely impacts regional uh, and local climate. Other estimates suggest the cloud could have reached as high as 127,000 feet, folks. Like I said, there's a report out there, 180,000. That seems a little high, but again, we really don't know. And when you see the pictures of the destruction from this volcano, it's, you know, it's believable to a sense. But 127,000 feet, folks, Mount Tambora went off at 122,000 ash plume, and it affected the northeast of the United States, and they had the year without a summer that following year. Coincidence? I guess we'll find out. I guess we'll find out how imp how impactful this particular volcano is. But to see a weather pattern, two back-to-back -back La Ninas, back-to-back -back winters, not saying it's not rare or not, you know, not possible, but... We're, we're seeing this continuing cooling effect and, and these things falling in the negative where if we were a warming planet, we wouldn't be in the negative. It doesn't add up. The folks out there who are preaching about man-made climate change, some of them are now saying that, that you know man had something to do with the volcanic eruptions. I know. Silly. Here, I want to show you guys something real quick, too, since we're talking about climate. This is awesome, by the way. I'm glad I found this. I want to read this. First, I want to show you the, I want to show you these graphs real quick. This really breaks things down, okay? So, taking a look at this graph here, this is where we are right now. I, I will agree with that. 16 is right about here. I will agree with that we are falling over the hill now as we head into the 2050s, which is where this line is suggesting where we are. The warming, the cooling, the warming, the cooling. This is empirical data, so this is confirmed that it went up, it went down. Look back here, 1,100, folks. Was it your private airplane? Now... I will say this, that we definitely have seen more warming since 1800s than we did prior to that. I will admit that. However, you can see that there is almost a cyclic action to this wave of up and down. It's almost precise. It almost follows solar cycles, folks. Hmm. Imagine that. I mean, in this period right here, it's unfair to say we've seen more warming since the industrial period because I'm judging this area right back here. This is during the Little Ice Age, the modern minimum. So this was a grand solar minimum back here. In fact, let's zoom out. Proving my point even more how cherry pickers these folks are in the AGW. This was definitely a cooler period of time because of a grand solar minimum. And then, of course, we had the Dalton minimum right in here. As we pulled out of these grand solar minimums, we warmed back up to normal. And now look at what's happening here. Now, the forecast shows warming continuing over the next 100 years or so. And if you look at Valentina Zarkova's work, she does predict warming as well by the end of this century. And I'm pretty sure their numbers are about the same. I'll, I'll go ahead and read from this. Many temperature reconstructs and the writings of historians speak of changing of climate in the recent few thousand years of history. 
especially where plants could and could not grow. The natural cycle of Minoan warming, Greek minimum, Roman warming, dark ages, cooling, medieval warming, and the little ice age give indication of current modern warming period that will peak somewhere between the years of 2100 and 2200. This warming, if follows, just a pattern will increase the current temperature naturally by 0.1 degrees Fahrenheit as much as 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. As it is proven in this presentation that carbon dioxide does not cause warming, then it must be understood that warming is all natural and there is no carbon dioxide warming causation or correlation. Again, look at these images. They speak for themselves. Little ice age, well below baseline on global temperatures. So they're cherry picking by showing us right here, oh, look how much warming we've had since 1600. Well, 1600 was during an historic grand solar minimum, a grand cycle, which I got to disagree with a little bit with this right here. I think it's going to go a little bit lower during this period of time before it goes back up because of this being grand cycle number two of the grand solar minimum. So, again, uh, I found this on a site on Facebook, How Dare You? And they had some very good stuff. There's a book they've written, How Dare You? Climate Change by CO2, Thy Art Society. Uh, check it out. I've seen a lot of good stuff so far from that particular author. And He's doing a really good job at trying to break it down for everyone to understand that warming and cooling is natural. Like I said, Zarkova's work matches up with what this person is saying as well. In fact, Zarkova said it first before this person did, if, if, I'm, if I'm correct on that. So anyway, yeah, cooling. Cooling is going to happen. I mean, look, it's natural. You know, it's we're going to warm, we're going to cool. You know, that's just the way it goes. And and right here, we are due for our next cooling cycle. Like I said, I'll agree we're right here. I'll go with that. And we're getting ready to drop down here. Okay. Maybe a little bit lower. Who knows? This model could be off. But the prediction of the warming up to 1 degree Fahrenheit to 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit by the end of this century, 2100, uh, again, lines up with what Zarkova was saying, too, when it comes to solar inertia motion. And that is part of her work that is confirming how we get the natural warming. I don't know why I backed all the way out there. Checking out some Twitter stuff here, folks. Another thing from How Dare You is on clouds. And this is important about what happened in Tonga. This coincides here, but no surface infrared makes it through clouds to outer space. Therefore, CO2 does not cause warming under the clouds. Interesting. If given only 10 seconds to respond to someone promoting or questioning of warming by carbon dioxide, the only proper answer is, get your pen and paper out, folks, clouds absorbing as gray body. They absorb 100% of the surface infrared while emitting almost as much downward and a worthy amount upward, nullifying a so-called warming by CO2. With more CO2 in the air, less infrared from clouds make it to the surface, resulting in cooler surface by 67% of the time. <laughs> so, when you see a volcanic eruption like Tonga going off, and as big as that ash plume is, and now the cloud coverage that we have over there, we know, we know that's going to affect the, 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 definitely the local and regional climate. But how far does it go if it affects the ocean temperatures as well? So clouds absorb infrared, and also clouds repel TSI as well. Cloud coverage, TSI cannot pierce through. It's reflected back into space. So this whole theory of CO2 warming the planet and your emissions are causing all these problems is just a, a lie. 
in, in a not climate change, but to change the economy, because there's a lot of millionaires who got really smart about plant based investments and electric cars and all this. And I thought, well, if we make it law, we'll stand to make a killing. Guarantee you, Mr. Biden has his hand in a couple of investments for the future as well for green energy. Trust me on that. They all do. That's why they're pushing it so hard. Why do you think they push the mandates of the shots? They all have investments in these pharmaceutical companies that make the shots. So there's billions, billions, if not trillions of dollars invested into grants and research towards man-made global warming. You can't come out and say, oops, we were wrong. Sorry, taxpayers, for blowing all that money on global warming by CO2. No, they're not going to admit this. They're going to hijack the events of the grand solar minimum and blame it on global warming and try to give you some coloring book description of the climate. Here at this channel, I think you'll find that you're going to see proof, not just claims, but the proof. Papers, excerpts like this, examples that show you how this works. Not just these baseless claims that you constantly see on trash rags like Washington Post and CNN where they have no clue how climate science works. They're also in the pockets of these people and they get paid to push these climate crisis fear porn articles so they can further make these people richer and themselves as well. There, I said it. And we're demonetized on YouTube, so we can say that and not to worry about getting uh, messed with on that side. Because you kind folks out there watching the program right now are Patreon members for the most part. And you guys are helping, supporting this channel, keeping us barely alive right now. We are on life support, I guess you could say. But I promise, guys, we are starting to turn the corner, rounding the turn the the daily content is coming back to the grand solar minimum and and watch out folks because there's a lot to go over and again it's been really hard for us to be away like we have but with so many things we got to finish up and wrap up trust me it'll be worth the wait mari's got some cool things on the horizon as well so good stuff to come folks but let's check out our gfs right now i'm going to make this comment before we start the forecasting Winter is definitely here. The cold is not going anywhere. And I think February, buckle up. Right now, January is taking a little breather. Some light snow moving across the northeast over tomorrow into Tuesday. More snow across the Great Lakes. Light, again, one to three inches possible. Storm system moving up into the Gulf, but quickly fizzles out and goes into the Atlantic. Lots of high pressure surrounding at least 70% of the United States, bringing in a big cold front further south. Light snow, but again, when it's so cold, when that Arctic air is just dominating, it is hard to get what moisture is in the air in the form of snow. In fact, it evaporates. This cold, high-pressure air dries it up, and it's just cold. Now, the beautiful part about when it's this cold is that you see the ice crystals floating in the air. The natural, the air is that cold. Mari and I left yesterday, and it was... Very sunny, and you could see ice crystal particles just floating everywhere. It was beautiful. But that's what we're seeing right now because of all this Arctic air. And it does feel like we're going to see it let up a little bit by the end of January. A brief, a brief mild shot across most of the Midwest and to the south by the time we get to the last day of January. More of the same for the Northeast and the Great Lakes and the Northern Plains. Snow and cold. But in the beginning of February... We start to see a couple of systems, and again, this was way far out there, but we are watching a couple of systems right now that could bring some pretty big storms here, especially this one here on February 4th, heading into the Northeast. This is where we get that brief warm-up, and that's going to fuel this storm with the moisture it needs, along with that Arctic front. This one could be a significant, again, too far to really say, because it's only the 23rd of January, plenty of time before this storm, but... GFS is signaling a pretty decent size storm to affect the Northeast. And then by the beginning of the second week of February, GFS is once again suggesting a major winter storm developing across the Midwest. Parts of Kansas, Missouri, icing in southern Illinois, parts of western Kentucky, western Tennessee. Boy, Tennessee has seen a lot of snow this year, man. Uh over a foot in just the last 10 days in parts of 
central Tennessee right now. So when you talk about climate change, yeah, we're starting to see a lot more snow, if you ask me. Snow in the south. The Carolinas getting snow again. Um, not the first time. They've had a couple different snowstorms this year. In fact, uh, a guy that uh, does hurricanes pretty well on Facebook, Mike's weather page, um, he has been chasing the snow, so to speak. So he's a snow enthusiast. He lives in Florida. He'll drive up to Tennessee or North Carolina, wherever he's got to go. But look at this, a snowstorm on the 29th of January in North Carolina and Virginia. And that could be worse than what that is. That's still far away, so we'll have to keep an eye on that one if that tracks any further west. And then, you know, just these icing events that are possible across uh, much of the warmer regions of the United States during the winter. But we'll have to watch here in the next few weeks. I think winter is going to be here with a vengeance, folks. Let's take a look at temperatures real quick. And the temperatures will suggest the same thing. This cold Arctic air is going nowhere. Florida, good for you. Miami, Daytona, awesome stuff. You live in the Northeast, though, Eastern Canada, whoo, it's going to be cold. It's going to be cold across the Northern Plains, the Great Lakes, Northeast Ohio as well. But this is a typical La Nina pattern, folks. Boy, man, look at all this Arctic air just chilling at the Canadian border. Absolutely just chilling right now, literally, no pun intended. But uh, what is keeping that Arctic air from just plunging down here into the United States? We don't know yet. And we haven't had that famous polar vortex experience yet where we see these deep, frigid temperatures. Is that on the way? That storm in Texas, is that setting the narrative up? Because there's a major low-pressure system that's going to be forming across Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas starting right here on February 8th, somewhere in that time frame. So we'll keep our eyes on that, but that's still too far away to really even uh, really concern ourselves with it. And as far as snowfall, like I said, January is taking a break. This is January 25th. Not a lot of snow to fall here in the next several days. If you live in Ohio, though, northeast Ohio, western Pennsylvania, and western New York, you get the snow that you want probably. A lot more snow across the northern plains, though, as we get towards the beginning of February, and then watch out here, a wide brand, a band of greens here across the northeast, and it does look like, I see a 20-inch snow, yep. So Albany looks like we'll have around 20 inches of snow on the ground by February 8th. So a big snow band, a big snow push coming our way right before we get some more Arctic cold in the middle of February. That's my prediction anyway. So more snow to come, just going to happen probably a little bit later once we get out of January, we'll see more snow across the Northern Plains, the Great Lakes, and the Northeast, parts of Northeast Ohio, Western Pennsylvania. Also, watch out in Missouri. You have a total of 15 inches that could be on the ground by the late or the middle part of February. I should say the 8th of February. It's not really middle. Snow across the Southwest region as well, but those are going to be in the higher terrain areas. So nothing out of the normal here plenty of snow and ice again um i want to point something out where this I, I think this article is snarky this is good winter relatively speaking by early january 22 arctic sea ice extent while well below average was within the lowest decile of recorded extents 1981 to 2010 reference period sea, sea ice now completely covers hudson bay the only area with substantially below average extent is the southern Baffin Bay and north of Labrador. But what they're not telling you is that each year, each year that goes by, we are seeing ice totals exceeding what we have from the years before. In other words, we are starting to see the sea ice growth strengthen. See that blue line right there? That represents us, 2021-2022. So we are inching back up as we are in the beginning of a grand solar minimum. We'll probably be somewhere around here by the 2030s, maybe slightly above by the 2040s, the 2050s on the outer edge here, before things start to decline again as we go back into another maximum cycle. 
the ice will retreat naturally and it will grow naturally. Thank you, Son, for giving us your glorious cycles. All right, I want to say hello to a few folks out there in the chat. As always, Knife Collector, good to see you out there, my friend. Scappy, Scrappy Cat, of course. Kansas Terry, good to see you out here. Mohammed, greetings, my friend. Melody, Arnold Schmidt, J Dog, Jerome from Rochester, New York. He says he's got some snow. We will have snow here in a little bit, I think later tonight or early tomorrow. Uh, Patricia Clayton, good to have you on board. Thank you, as always. Uh, let's see who else I saw in here earlier. Many, many other new faces in here as well. Of course, hello to my lovely wife, Mari. Hello there, baby. Uh, and uh, yeah, no, good room, right? Lots of new faces too. So guys, happy to have you. Like I said, bear with us. About eight more days, you'll start to see a more regular schedule of content coming from our channel. If you want to donate to the channel, we ask that you just go ahead and go to Patreon and just sign up for a buck. And that way, the donation, if it's going to be 10 bucks, well, it could be 10 months of Patreon. We feel that that would help the channel thrive a little bit more on the continued support, even if it's just a dollar a month. That's all it takes to get things rolling over here, folks. So again, we appreciate all of our Patreon supporters who have been with us through the last couple of months. We haven't delivered on the content that we wanted to, but that's changing very soon. And we appreciate your support as always. Folks, that's going to do it for me today. I hope everyone has a great rest of your weekend, and we will talk soon. Take care, folks.